Electric Utopia. Such an intoxicating omelette. Dude. But isn't it funny how the fanboys, the diehards, never actually stop to consider the eggs? I'm Tom Logan from AutoExpert.com.au. New cars, cheap, dude. But Australia only. Website, card. Now, with those formalities thankfully out of the way, I thought we'd address this comment that I get all the time in its various flavours. And up front, let me say that I fully appreciate how the road to electric utopia for some people is functionally, at least, a religious pilgrimage. And in the context of human history, it doesn't end well for people who argue the toss with some prevailing religion. And yet, journalism is the subtle art of being just that Goldilocks toss-arguing pain in the ass, And just latex glove, dude. Here we go. This latest one is from Anne Dude or Dudette, who goes by the unlikely moniker of Tony Journeyman, 1944. Tony has a unique way with words and goes... Well... If you want to make an omelette, you got to break some eggs. It's very difficult to argue with that, Tony. And large and impractical EVs are the, some of the eggs that are going to get broken in the no doubt flawed transition to EVs proceeds. I do hope this is English second language speaking and not just I was unconscious for my entire secondary education, Tony. There ain't going to be any perfection during this transition, and with opinions being as plentiful as assholes, there's going to be plenty to whine about. Well, the job of the professional, pain in the ass, the award-winning investigative shit-stirrer, is basically to whine about stuff. But to get out the magnet and forge a limpet-like attachment of one's whining with the facts. So let's do that now. Let's take a snapshot of the whole omelette eggs paradigm and just use that as a prism through which to view the current state of play on that road to electric utopia. Take a bit of a snapshot and see how we go. Now you might be offended by this if you are on that path to EU but uh, if you just hate what I say you've got to ask yourself why you're outraged by it. Is it because I'm wrong? In which case please address the facts and tell me if I'm wrong and I'd be happy to offer a correction down the track. But if it's just because you don't like the facts, then go on a journey of inward discovery, dude, and realign yourself with fucking reality. So let's look at Volkswagen, because they're the number one car maker on earth, and they're sort of a criminal conspiracy also. That's just a fact. But you've got to look at... Go back to 2015, when the whole criminal conspiracy came to light, and... The public were informed that the boardroom in Wolfsburg was actually lined with human excrement. Metaphorically, like, that's how they rolled. Who knew? So, in order to clean that up, they did get out a couple of big industrial-sized scrapers and get cracking on the walls, but they also installed a dude named Herbert Dies. And Mr Dies's mission was to clean up Volkswagen, to green them up because they were properly brown at the time, and they only got browner for several years. So this is kind of swimming against the tide, and Mr. DS was the salmon spawning, wasn't he? Going upstream. So hard. So his mission was to electrify the crap out of them and get on board with all the green messaging, and he invented all of this stuff, and I got the feeling that he made a few catastrophic mistakes for a CEO, like for starters, I thought he actually believed in that shit, like he was committed to it because of a deep-seated belief, and CEOs need to have all of the, all of the facts and all of their commitment needs to be disposable, they need to get up tomorrow with a completely different mission, if that's what the corporation demands, it's like... Yeah, that's how they roll. So he invented this new architecture called Trinity, or he proposed it anyway. He was going to get some brainiacs to invent it, obviously. The interesting name, because why would you call your new electric platform architecture 
the same name as the notorious plutonium implosion bomb test site in Los Alamos, America. I don't get that association, but anyway, it was called Trinity. He was going to build a two billion US dollar factory to build Trinity in Wolfsburg, so yay. Unfortunately, though, reality bit him on the ass because it came to light just how much that was going to cost and how little profit it was going to make and how many jobs were going to be lost as a consequence of these changes of direction to head to Electric Utopia. Uh, problematically, Volkswagens, of course, publicly listed. Two of the seats on the board go to the unions because they're such a big shareholder and those two dudes just about pooped in their duds, didn't they, when they figured out how many jobs were going to be lost. And the most expedient course of action there to rectify all of this unrest, now that Volkswagen had sort of gotten over the hump of its criminality and people were forgetting about that, was just to throw Mr. DS under the bus. And uh, in a mafia-like move of utter brilliance, Volkswagen installed a friend of the family as the CEO He's named Oliver Bloom. Now, Mr. Bloom had a complex mission as well, still has a complex mission. That mission is to keep all the rhetoric flowing, all the bullshit green rhetoric flowing, but also at the same time sprint away from everything Mr. Dies was paid to get cracking, right? So Trinity is under the bus. The two billion buck factory not going to happen, okay? That's all just toast. And Mr. Bloom's job is to stand in front of the public and go, we're so fucking green, okay? But at the same time, run away from all of these green initiatives that were just going to be a budget black hole and a job loser, which was complete anathema to the board members, right? So at the same time as this delightful schism <laughs> is playing out at Volkswagen... The German government decided, this was in September, they decided to end their EV subsidy program. Now, the German government was promoting EV sales by incentivizing, subsidizing businesses to buy EVs. And they woke up and said, it's all over in September, dudes. So there was this spike of EV, this frenzied EV purchase uh, by Businesses across Germany in August and then flatline after that because the subsidies have evaporated and EVs just suddenly got more expensive, didn't they? So this has caused demand to crash. And this is emblematic of what has happened everywhere around the world. EV sales are quite prolific when there's big government subsidies and when they dry up, so do the sales. This has been the experience for many years around the world in all markets where EVs were subsidised, right? So Volkswagen's been ramping back its production as a consequence of that as well. So that's Volkswagen. Let's look at Tesla now. Tesla is the number 19 company, car company in the world based on 2022 revenue, I think. So... Electric Jesus cut prices by as much as 20% recently. Now, you have to appreciate that cars are a high capital cost, low margin product. You can't actually cut prices by 20% too often and remain viable. The business model doesn't work that way. Okay, it just doesn't, dude. So... The other feedback effect of doing this, like if you're EJ and you wake up one morning and, you know, you have this miraculous vision, a bush is on fire and it speaks to you and says, cut prices, dude, 20%'s okay. If you do that, the unintended consequence of that is everyone who's bought your product recently, just they under the bus also, aren't they? Because the value of their already depreciating asset just goes because the new one just got cheaper. Therefore, the old one is worth less. This happens all the time. And it's not just like a three-day sale. It's not Black Friday Tesla discount. This is like, we've dropped the price. It's like permanent. 
existing owners would be feeling a little pissed off, and among them I would categorise the CEO of car rental giant Hertz, who made this bold commitment some years ago to buy, I don't know, 100,000 Teslas or something. And it was huge, and EJ got his trillion-dollar valuation off the back of that announcement, right? So it was a win-win. Hertz looked green. EJ got his trillion buck valuation and that gave him a little teepee in his trousers, obviously, as it does. But the reality of all of that EV ownership for Hertz, it was not the utopia that the CEO had expected because the vehicles were not reliable enough. They got damaged too often. They cost a shit ton to repair. And also the depreciation was unsustainable in the context of the business model. So he's basically basically run away from that commitment to install all of those EVs because the business model doesn't work. Okay? And let's move now to General Motors, which I think was the number one, no, sorry, the number eight car maker in the world by uh, revenue in 2022, okay? They're slinking out the back door on EV production also right now. That's been all across the news. Effectively, what they're saying is they're delaying <laughs> the advent of the Silverado and GMC Sierra EVs, right? And they're just ramping back their EV plans generally. What they're actually doing is sprinting away at a million miles an hour, but making it seem like it's just a casual temporary retreat. They have discovered that EVs are just this miraculous bottomless hole in the road. You can make a small fortune out of them if you start with a gigantic one. Just keep shoveling it in there until it's virtually all gone. So the plans at GM for those 400,000 EVs by mid-2024, they are under the fucking bus, dude. They do not exist anymore, okay? And there is not a serviette in the freaking universe that's big enough to wipe all of the electric egg off Mary Barra's face. There's just not. Mary Barra's the CEO, if you're not from around here. Okay, so Ford now, number five by revenue in 2022, number five car maker in the world. Ford's share price collapsed by 12.3%. At the end of October. That's just a couple of weeks ago, right? That was after they made a public announcement. This is the problem with being a publicly listed company. You have to keep reporting the financials, right? They revealed just how big an EV black hole they were in. And frankly, the losers at Ford, who are asleep at the wheel every day in Dearborn at the highest level... No reference to individuals is made. This is a corporate thing, okay? I think some very capable people manage Ford and collectively the company just makes the stupidest decisions imaginable over and over and over. There's a litany of this stuff. They do engineering badly because I think they put bean counters in charge and, all. you know, it's... Don't get me started, dude. Anyway, they've officially proposed that they're postponing the company's $12 billion commitment to EVs. We're not, not doing it. We're just, we're just postponing it, dude. And this is in the context of its unsold pickup trucks stretching over the freaking horizon in dealer lots across America, right? This official postponing strategy is actually brilliant on the part of... General Motors and Ford in particular, because they're not not doing it. We're just postponing it, dude. This is like a veneer of export-grade bullshit going over the top of the facts, the behaviour, right? Publicly, we're postponing it. Privately, we'd like to declare the whole project a witch and burn it at the frickin' stake, you know? But they can't do that because they need to keep appeasing green dickhead politicians, right? Because the politicians are there and they're going green. We're going to use... Rebound. We're going to use the EVs to save the planet, even though, you know, light vehicles are only like 10% of greenhouse. 
So the official strategy, postpone, postpone, postpone. And I suspect the event horizon of this postponement is just going to go back and back and back and back. And that lets them say, still committed, time's just not exactly right when 2025 and in 2024 we can go to 2027 kind of thing. You know, that's this is the game they're playing. Now on the supply side, right, of batteries, there is insufficient raw materials, the lithium, the cobalt, things like this, to meet the projected demand to keep things rolling to electric utopia. There was a major mining conference in Western Australia about uh, 14 or 15 months ago now, and the boss of lithium for Rio Tinto, and she gets paid to understand lithium better than just about anyone else, right? Modelling lithium production, the pricing, all of the economic factors about it, capital investment, where the resources are, what things can we start, what things are we going to have to wind up, blah, 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 what are our competitors doing? This is the world she lives in. And she basically stands up in front of the whole industry and says, we've modelled all of that for lithium, all of the existing mines and the mines that are projected foreseeably to come on song in the foreseeable future, and there's no way that the demand for batteries can be met. No way, right? And she would know. So... How are we going to make the batteries? Nobody knows, right? It seems like we need magic to do that. Or the miraculous technology, the new technology that never actually arrives after decades, right? On the disposal side of batteries, like at the end of their lives, that's shaping up to be an epic environmental disaster too because there's no mandate to recycle, right? And lithium hexafluorophosphate, in the groundwater is like Aaron Brockovich 2.0. Nobody wants that, but that's what's going to happen. The free market will not do this on its own. Now, here's the thing, right? This alleged circular economy that we're all sold, it's a complete pup too. It's bullshit, okay? Because if you've got something that's valuable, someone will buy it. That's the free market, right? Someone buys it at price X, does something to it, adds value in some way by recycling it or whatever, and then sells it for price X plus margin, right? That's how the economy works. The problem with lithium ion batteries is they're worthless, okay? Now, I'll give you a great example of this about waste, okay? If you've got waste aluminium, aluminium saucepans, aluminium cans, aluminium window or door frames, whatever. If you've got aluminium or brass or copper or stainless steel even, you can take that material to your local scrap metal joint and they will pay you for it because it's got value. They won't pay you much. You're not going to retire on it. But if you've got that lying around, it's Probably better to do that, if particularly if money's tight, than it is just to put it in the recycling, okay? Nobody's doing that with lithium-ion batteries. They're not saying cash for batteries, are they? Nobody, because they're not worth anything. Lead-acid batteries are worth something, but I suspect one of the impediments to dealing with the problem of recycling lithium-ion batteries, apart from the energy intensivity of that, is the problem of the toxicity. How do you manage that, you know? And how do you make a profit at the end of it? So they're valueless and our dickhead regulators are not instilling by legislation the responsibility for the materials on anyone. The car maker is no longer responsible for the batteries once they sell the product to you. You're not responsible for the batteries once you dispose of it. Nobody's responsible. And something that's worth nothing, just have a look, dude. Where's it go? It goes into the landfill. So the circular economy, sorry, not seeing it. And for owners now, the advances in battery tech that we get told by everyone from electric Jesus down, every freaking battery day, exciting new battery tech, it's not happening. Like, it's really not happening. We get incremental advances in existing technology, but really all they're doing is tweaking the chemistry a bit. See, there's multiple factors. They all impact on others, like you've got life and 
discharge rate is a classic. So if you want a big discharge rate, like for a powerful, sporty EV, you can tweak the chemistry to allow a slightly faster discharge, but the battery gets less safe, which is why it's always Porsche take cans that are burning and taking various facilities out, including floating ones, right? And so safety takes a, a bath when you tweak for performance and, you know, uh, longevity takes a bath as well when you tweak for performance. So you're not getting anything for free here, but we have seen incremental tweaks in existing technology. There's no new battery technology threatening to come out of the blocks and make lithium obsolete. Like If there is, you point me to it because I'm not seeing it. I'm seeing a lot of thought bubbles about what might work, but I'm not seeing anything that's production ready or just a bees endophallus away from production readiness. Like, show me the production ready or near ready battery tech. It doesn't exist. Insurers are running away from EVs because they're too dangerous, basically, and it's going to start getting very difficult to put EVs in places based on the insurance implications, right? They burn hotter, longer, faster. They're so hot that they are easily capable of destroying the structural integrity of reinforced concrete structures because the steel only needs to get to about 600 degrees to lose its structural integrity integrity, that's degree C, whereas the fire itself burns at about 2,000 degrees C, which is above the melting point of steel. So it's easy to see a few EVs in a particular place catching fire, jumping from one to the other, heating things up and causing a massive structural collapse. And I suspect if we did a forensic examination of the structural collapse at Luton Airport in the United Kingdom, then we might see the structural collapse linked to an enclave of EVs which caught fire. But they didn't cause the fire, they were just there and they burned hotter, faster and more toxically than a combustion vehicle ever could. And this contributes obviously to the severity of the consequences. And the depreciation of course is just biting owners in the arse and what we see, particularly outside of Tesla owners, because they tend to be a little bit religious, but what we see outside of the Tesla fold is that many first-time EV owners are just running back to combustion at the end of their foray into doing the right thing because it's just so freaking inconvenient and uh, also a financial disaster. So there's that. So look, what I'd say to Tony is, I understand the omelette eggs proposition, I really do. It's unfortunate that the eggs have to break, but hey, we ended up with this really, really tasty omelette, so yay. The benefit outweighs the cost, in other words, and this could be a financial proposition or a moral and ethical one, whatever, but the broken eggs are forgivable if the omelette is worth it, right? So the question I've got for Tony and everybody else who says this to me, and this is a legitimate question, right? It's like, okay, dude, I can see the broken eggs. I get it. In fact, if I was in the International Space Station, I'd be able to see the pile of broken eggs. The question I've got is, where's your fucking omelette? 